ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, this is a, you might as well call it a special presentation. You come to my channel and I literally talk about everything and you will find that the understanding of things and the knowledge of things is very unlimited. Um, not because I'm patting myself on the back. This is just the way things are. Ladies and gentlemen, this document right here is designed for those of you who've run into problems with traffic tickets and having to go to court. Now, it's talking about the present tense as things have already happened and they're ready to set things for trial. You have the right to challenge the court's jurisdiction and the officer's jurisdiction. These are your rights. This thing is riddled with case citations, not case law. Cases are not law, never were law. It is hard to explain that to people, so stop using that term. The first thing this thing does is it challenges the jurisdiction, the venue, the in rem jurisdiction, and the in personam jurisdiction over the person, over the venue, and over the actual law. Okay? Subject matter. Ladies and gentlemen, these are what you have the right to do. You can challenge it at any time. They cannot deny you. Pay attention because this is very important. Your right to challenge the jurisdiction of the court falls under the First Amendment right to petition for redress of grievance. That's, where the, that's why the Supreme Court continues to say, here's the reason for it. Jurisdiction may be challenged at any time, even on appeal, because you have a right to petition for redress of grievance, and no one can deprive you of that right. That's why the first thing it does, it talks about, now look, hold on now, this was written for a person of color. There are certain parts in here where it talks about that person being a person of color. Even if you are, quote unquote, white, you're still a person of color. Last I check, white is in the spectrum. Pay attention. In her case, they tried to call her a sovereign citizen. The attorney general has labeled sovereign citizens as terrorists, domestic terrorists. That's libel and slander if they haven't actually sentenced her or charged her with being a sovereign citizen. Do you know that there is no law against being a sovereign citizen? Go ahead and take a look at it. There's no statute or law saying that you cannot be one of them sovereign citizens. Now, I'm not telling any of you to become a so-called sovereign citizen. It's an oxymoron. You cannot be sovereign and then be a subject at the same time. A citizen is a subject. The subject of the king. So you can't be sovereign and be subject to anyone at the same time. <sighs> Sorry. You must accuse the judge and the court, because it's not just the judge or the officials, of acting in clear absence of all jurisdiction. That is the catchphrase. You'll see there's a lot of those throughout this document, a lot of things necessary to say. If they cut you off while you are talking, ever, you let them know that I have the right to equal time and I have the right to have this stated on the record. And no, you will not make me shut up. I need you to shut up while I exercise my right to speak in these proceedings and to get my facts on the record. Just that simple, ladies and gentlemen. It goes about explaining A to Z, Driver's License Protection Act and that wonderful little Highway Act, showing how ain't no law. That's an agreement. It actually says it in there. That's an agreement between the state and the legislature. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a private contract. has nothing to do with the people. That's those elected officials deciding to do whatever they want to do. They have the right to contract under Perry versus United States, under the contract clause of the Constitutional Constitution. So let them do their little contracting, but that ain't got nothing to do with me. They have the right to regulate commerce. They do not have the right to regulate private commerce. Pay attention. There is such a thing as private commerce. They do not get to regulate private commerce, ever. There is no authority or jurisdiction. Look, this is what I explained to one gentleman 
I was just thinking about this on my trip up here and talking to my God. Um, and while he and I were having a conversation as I'm taking my 45 minute to an hour and 15 minute drive from the city, he and I were discussing the Constitution. Ladies and gentlemen, the courts don't have a right to overrule you. There is no authority in law for the courts to issue a ruling over the public, over the people. They don't have the authority to rule over a person. Go ahead and look at the Constitution. Nothing in the Constitution gives them the authority to make a ruling. They're not sovereign. The courts are bound by the Constitution. The Constitution dictates to them what their jurisdiction is. They are not sovereign. Congress, the Constitution dictates to Congress what its jurisdiction is. Congress is not sovereign. The executive branch is dictated to as to what its jurisdiction is by the Constitution. They all take an oath to the Constitution. So from for them, the sovereign is the Constitution, not them. Police officers are not the authority. They get their authority from someplace, i.e., not sovereign. Some of you guys are going to understand that. Hold on now. Let me give you a, a mind blower. The people, the private person, where do they get their authority from? No, I'm going to give you some time to think about it. All right? The people don't get their authority from no instrument. What, 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 what did they say in the Declaration of Independence? They received their ordination from God. Those of you who choose to believe. Well, technically, it's not a choice. You don't have a you don't have a choice. It's not up to you to determine whether or not he exists or not. That's not your choice. You're not that powerful. Same thing I'm saying about the court. The people don't derive their jurisdictional authority from anywhere. The right over their private property is their right. Nobody can subject them. Not without due process of law. That's what the people agreed to. Let's continue, shall we? As it challenges the court jurisdiction, this is a Supreme Court case talking about the enactment of Title IV-D. For those of you who pay child support, this is the act that gives them the right to collect child support. Well, technically, they claim they get the right, but this says that Congress did this under its spending cause or the commercial cause. See? Spending clause power. Ladies and gentlemen, so what? doesn't have any authority over the states. The Congress cannot force the states to do anything. Congress can come up with whatever law they want, but that 10th and 9th and 10th Amendment prohibits them from enforcing their power over you and the states. The states are sovereign. Why? Because the states are made up of the people. The United States is sovereign. Why? Because the United States is made up of the people. That is the sovereign. The people created the power for the United States. Go back and look at the Declaration and go back and look at the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't give a single person a single right. It's not written for the people. It is a restraining order. Go back and look at it. It tells government how far it can go. It doesn't rule over you. It rules over them. That's why they have to take an oath to that document. Again, if you don't believe me, go back and read it. Okay? It's already there, written, done, and said. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is not going to be long. This is the Driver's License Protection, Privacy Protection Act. Ladies and gentlemen, Congress admits that they did that under its Commerce Clause. So if they did it under their Commerce Clause, why are they trying to apply it to you? They don't have the right to do so. Um, give me a second. I'll be right back. I have to go take care of some things. Okay, I just had to step outside and clean my camera lenses because spiders like to leave for some reason. their are webs all around cameras for some dumb reason. And it sets off the alarm, so I have to make sure I don't hear that going off all the time. All right. As a side note, the Special Committee on the Termination of National Emergencies created by the United States Senate in 1973 was tasked with examining the consequences of terminating the declared state of emergencies of state of national 
emergencies that were still in effect. Now, it goes ahead and it talks about these 470 sections of laws. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if those 470 sections of laws were declared by Congress to be unconstitutional, pay attention, this is what they said, the report issued by the committee provided an inventory of approximately 470 sections of federal law that unconstitutionally extended emergency powers to the president and the executive branch. I didn't say that. Congress said that. 470 laws. Which one of those 470 laws are still in effect and being applied to you? So you're challenging. That is unconstitutional. The Highway Aid, the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956, that's the thing that governs all the highways. That's how you see on your gas pump that they receive federal funding. They made it so that states, they had to consent to this agreement if they wanted federal funding. It's all about federal funding. As long as they're receiving federal funding, those highway laws don't apply to you because Congress doesn't have any authority to regulate your private travel. They can do commerce among the state, but not commerce among the people. There is no authority for them to regulate the people. Excuse me. Again, the laws are here. We put the law here for you guys, and we explain everything. Now, this highlights Florida. In the state of Florida, for example, it uses Florida as an example because the person whom this was done for lives in Florida. Got to get some act right. They have what's known as the Joint Legislative Management Committee, JLMC. JLMC in Florida, wait, hold on, (laughs) make sure y'all get what's happening. The House of Representatives and the State Senate got together and they put together this committee to codify the law. Ladies and gentlemen, if the committee puts together the codification of the law, then that is not law. It's just some publication somebody put together because the law is the legislative process where it is produced by the legislature and that committee, none of them are part of the legislature. Well, let's look at Florida for just for an example on Florida. Let me see if we have that. Dang it, I don't have it here. This is the end of the document, ladies and gentlemen, because this only mentions that we're about to add some more stuff, so y'all be y'all be patient is what it says. Okay? Ladies and gentlemen, I am and will be challenging the jurisdiction of the statute in this and in subsequent petitions before this court. So we're not just, that that's not it. You see that right there? See that line right there? There's more to it. It's 25 pages worth of stuff. Of the 25, three pages are the giraffe. Because you always want to do a giraffe. You don't want to do an acknowledgement. Always a giraffe. Why? A giraffe is a sworn or firm testimony. It's evidence in court. You always want to do a giraffe. You file something in court, always want to do a giraffe. Look at this. Completing this information can deter alterations of the document and or fraudulent reattachment of this form to an unintended document. Okay, this was taken from Florida, but the International Independent Notary Association revised it to fit your situation. Okay, now this one right here, I do hereby exercise my right to challenge the so-called statute. Ladies and gentlemen, that revision council, every state has one. Title, attorney, lobbyist. Title, attorney. Title, businessman, engineer. Title, social worker, political activist. Title, attorney. What? Title, attorney. Businessman. Title, attorney. Businessman. Child advocate. Educator. Attorney. What the? (laughs) Excuse me. Pay attention. Attorneys. Oh, and former representatives. Title attorney. Title attorney. Title attorney. Title attorney. None of them are legislatures. And if they're attorneys, they all work for the executive branch. Attorneys are under the attorney general's office. They work for the executive branch. He's the top attorney for the state executive branch. They cannot make law. You need to understand what the legislative process is. So go to ChatGPT or BARD and ask it to explain the legislative process and then ask the question, can any unelected official participate in the legislative process and enact a law? Go ahead. 
when they codify law, they add all kind of numbers and other things and dashes and they edit things and they give commentary and explanation and all of that stuff. They're not Congress. They can do that all they want, but they cannot make that law. You're not bound by anything other than the law. You are bound to follow the law. The law is the legislative process in the United States. Go back and pay attention, people. Now, the Constitution for the state of Florida, you have to put your Constitution that talks about the legislative powers. The legislative power shall be vested in a legislator, which consists of the Senate and the House. It don't say nothing about no attorney. Okay, it says senators and congressional members of the House. There's no mention of any joint legislative management committee in the term legislature. Okay, it says Senate in the House. It does not say a joint legislative management committee. It doesn't say nothing about that in the Constitution, which means it's unconstitutional. The people did not receive authority from a document, whether it be the Constitution or any other contractual agreement. The people's authority is inherent. Okay, making a lot of statements will pay attention. EIN number for that Joint Management Committee, just for Florida as an example, but your state has the same thing. They have their own EIN number. Then for the Judicial Council for the state of Florida, the courts have their own EIN number. EIN numbers is for taxpayers. Shh, don't tell nobody. EIN numbers is for taxpayers. Their comprehensive annual financial reports, oh, their tax filings, every state files a comprehensive annual financial report. Thank you, Clint Richardson. Okay. Clint Richardson did the Corporation Nation in 2012, where he actually confronted the uh, what, director of the interior for the United States for the Interior Department, and he highlighted the fact that they all file comprehensive annual financial reports, and there are notes, ledgers, term definitions, and references identify them as private corporations, that they're privately owned. We already shown you how the Vanguard Group owns, pay attention, the SEC. Have the same EIN number. Ain't that something else? No wonder they so rich. $20 billion. Hey, Vanguard, hey, 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 I, 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 hey don't, uh, no, I'm just, I'm just, it was public information. Okay, public information. Y'all don't, don't, no, it's okay. Anyway. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, the IRS, we explain what the IRS gives out EIN numbers for. Now, you're going to love the last document, so give me a moment. Sovereignty lies within the people, the common community, and not the person. Ladies and gentlemen, the people, that group right there, the people, they are the sovereign. Pay attention. This matter involved the question of whether or not the United States could succeed from the Union. Ladies and gentlemen, the state of Texas, the Supreme Court ruled that the, session, the secession was illegal, arguing that the Constitution created a perpetual union and that the people, pay attention, the people of the United States had ultimately decided on this form of government. The people, not the person, reinforcing the idea that the will of the people as expressed throughout the Constitution, is binding on all states and individuals. Pay attention. The will of the people, and by the, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, the will as expressed in the Constitution. So guess what, ladies and gentlemen? The Constitution does not command you to do a single thing. Go back and look at the Constitution and see if it commands you to do a single thing. I dare you to find something that commands you in the Constitution to do anything. Constitution commands these government officials. That's why they have to take an oath. I pledge allegiance. Anyway, they have to take an oath to the Constitution. All right, let's go on. So I apologize to the court, the institution for which it stands, one nation anyway, for my lack of understanding. But please let me state for the record that I do not understand the charges. I do not understand their delegation of authority and how any such non-law that is not part of the legislative process would apply to the private citizenry or civilianry, excuse me, not citizenry. Oh God, don't want to be a citizen. Want to be a civilian, civilianry. My word, 
I created that patent hit. Anyway, if the legislative process is established via the Constitution, then where pre tell did the state legislature obtain the authority to circumvent the process? pre tell Anyway, and then we have these cases right here. Jurisdiction may be challenged at any time, even on final determination or appeal. This case reinforced the petition that no sanctions can be imposed absent proof of jurisdiction. If they don't prove jurisdiction, they cannot proceed with any case. They know these things. That's why they must get you to plea. Why? Because when you go over these, you will see, as we explained before, a plea is the first step. Now, by the way, when you take a look at this jurat and this, uh, this certificate of certification, like I said, you're going to learn some things, ladies and gentlemen. Each attorney for each state must be registered, and I gotta I gotta clear this up. You guys gotta get rid of this rule thing. I I did not do that, and so I apologize. So watch this, copy, <sighs> replace. Now I gotta do it. No, I'm gonna make y'all do it. Y'all not gonna do this to me. My job is just to put this junk together. Put this junk together. It took too long. And I don't feel like it's taking longer. Okay. Replace. It's going to be twice. One and one more. Because I already did on one of them. Okay. Got to get rid of that. And come on now. Got one more to do. Copy. I didn't know it was going to be like that, y'all. Paste. And, and to make it easier on me. Copy. Case. It's only going to be one, and so we're going to replace. Whoa, wait a minute. Oh, that's oh the reason why, because I took the, <laughs> give me one second. I took that, that little gap out, so I need the gap. Fall into the gap. Okay, it finished. All right, we're back to the beginning. All right, ladies and gentlemen, what you didn't know is that the clerk of the court, as explained right here, requires all attorneys, including the Supreme Court for the state, requires all attorneys to be connected to the so-called email service system, the electronic email service system. They all have to register for that portal. They have to pay the annual fees. That means they waive their right to service by service of process and have chosen to be served through the clerk of the court, that the clerk of the court has agreed to give them a copy of all documents that are filed, and they give them an electronic copy of the document. You don't have to mail a copy to these idiots. The clerk of the court is your process server. They're not a party to the case. They're over the age of 18, and they're required by law to send a copy of everything filed in the record to all of the attorneys associated with the record. Ta-da. So you can file the documents through the clerk of the court. You don't even have to tell the clerk of the court that's what you're doing. Okay, just go ahead and read this when you get finished. This actually comes from the rules of the court. Sorry, I've known about it for years. Some of you guys are going to understand how important that is. Again, here's the Jurat. Jurat's already complete. The only thing, see, this says the state of Florida. I thought I got rid of that. So give me a second. This is supposed to be underscore, 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 underscore. Let's go all the way. We're going all the way. I don't know how that could not be done because I did do it. And I went through. Oh, that's right. The I shut off the computer and I didn't save it. So that's my fault. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here is the document of all documents. This is the document that says, how dare this insensitive court subject me to involuntary servitude. That's right, you guys are all slaves. See, the first thing is, there's a known fact that the case involved two mentally retarded men who were held in involuntary servitude by, on a respondent's form. The court held that the 13th Amendment prohibit not only physical coercion, but psychological coercion sufficient to overbear the will of a person and compel him to work against his will. Ladies and gentlemen, what's this all about? Well, when the court enters a plea on your behalf, it is violating your due process rights. The court does not have the authority to enter a plea on behalf of no one. As a matter of fact, what you didn't know, that there is no law requiring you to enter a plea. 
of guilty, not guilty, not a contender, or any other type of plea. Any plea means you're pleading to the jurisdiction. If you don't believe me, watch this. Entry of a plea amounts to subjecting oneself to the court's jurisdiction. By entering a plea of not guilty, the defendant submitted himself to the jurisdiction of the court. Submission means servant. You will kneel to Zod. Why would I want to submit to Zod? That would make no sense. Why in the world would I submit to Zod? Sorry, I was checking my uh, camera system because somebody just drove down the road that Ain't nobody driving now. Oh, well, life goes on. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the defendant, by entering a plea of not guilty to the indictment, subjected himself to the jurisdiction of the court. Pay attention and waived all objections to the veneer of the jury. Excuse me? You mean once you submit to the court's jurisdiction, all of their rules and everything apply and you don't have no say-so whatsoever? No say so whatsoever. Lord have mercy, y'all. Lord have mercy. So when a court enters a plea on your behalf, it is waiving your rights. Those, hey, you know, a plea must be voluntary, and they must tell you, pay attention, the consequences of such actions, and they never tell you. So these cases explicitly state that entering a plea, regardless of the specific type of plea, constitutes submitting oneself to the court's jurisdiction. This supports the conclusion that entering a plea inherently involves acknowledging the court's authority to proceed with the case, and it also makes you a subject to the court's jurisdiction. If the court had jurisdiction, pay attention, then there would be no need for you to submit yourself to the court's jurisdiction because they would already have jurisdiction. Ta-da! The judicial officer was fully cognizant of the fact that when it entered a plea of not guilty for the defendant, it was subjecting him to the juris subjecting the defendant to the jurisdiction of the court, amounting to involuntary servitude in violation of the Fifth Amendment principles of the United States of America and its corresponding constitutional amendment for the state of, and you put the state's name. Now, I did not give the court or its officers permission to speak on my behalf. I and I most certainly did not consent to it subjected me. It's supposed to be subjecting, so I'm glad I'm correcting it now. I've already proofread it, I-N-G, me to the consequences associated with entering any kind of plea. Since slavery has been outlawed in the United States and subjecting my person to involuntary servitude amounts to a severe deprivation of rights, and I object and I do not consent to anyone subjecting me yeah, I need a uh, ING to anyone's jurisdiction and claiming that I have accepted and or acknowledged a so-called statute and or code and or rule and or regulation and or ordinance as law having jurisdiction over my person as such is unconstitutional without my consent. Watch this. Wake up. Unconscionable as well as Stop listening. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, these cases, when a court has no jurisdiction over the subject matter, its proceedings are coram non justesi. Without it's void. It means in want of jurisdiction. Consent cannot give jurisdiction. You cannot say, Oh, I give you jurisdiction over me, Your Honor. No, they must have it or they don't. Either they have it or they don't which is why they will never tell you all of the different little caveats that make them appear to have jurisdiction. Their jurisdiction is prima facie at best, okay, every single time. That's why you can always attack jurisdiction, even after conviction. We got so many people who have relatives who are in jail. Ladies and gentlemen, use this document. Don't do an appeal. Go into small claims court with each and every one of them. 
and tell them you are challenging the jurisdiction of the court and the state, and you want to sue in small claims court the attorney general's office because they're the ones who brought the charge. You sue the attorney general's office as a private corporation, and you sue them for not adhering to the law, and you sue them for the total amount in small claims court. All you're looking for is a judgment in your favor in small claims court. And if they rule against you, then appeal it. Small claims is a whole lot quicker. It's the people's court. You don't need to be an attorney. And by the way, they can't send an attorney. Sorry. Small claims court. They'll say that they're immune, but they're not because they're a private corporation. Small claims court. Okay. The court lacked jurisdiction for entering the not guilty plea on my behalf. Now, I want you to pay attention, ladies and gentlemen. There's not a lot of comments. There's not a lot of me explaining anything or you explaining anything. It's just the court's explaining Formalization, there's no delegation of authority. Okay, now again, we talk about this person is a person of color. So we say when a judge entered a plea of not guilty, it either is an impartial jurist, an attorney, or a next friend. Either way, the court enters a plea on behalf of the defendant. This dual capacity strips the court and or a judicial officer of any jurisdiction from presiding over the matter. The judge is either a judge or he's an attorney, or he's a next friend. He cannot be all three. He cannot change his capacities. What you guys don't understand, he can't be two persons at one time. That's impersonation. That's fraud. So he has to either be a judge or a defense attorney. He cannot enter a plea on your behalf because you must not only be present, but you must enter a plea knowingly, willingly, and intentionally. He cannot enter a plea on your behalf. Impossible. Sorry. It explains that so that you get it. And again, we use the cases. No plea of guilty may be entered against the express wishes of a competent defendant. If you tell them, oh, no, I don't want to enter a plea, I'm not required to enter a plea, the trial court has a duty to ensure that the plea is truly voluntary and that the defendant understands the consequences of his plea. The court cannot subject you to consequences, ladies and gentlemen, because if it subjected you to consequences, that amounts to involuntary servitude. Not without your consent, they can't. Okay. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this person is a woman. That's why I highlighted the person of color. Okay? You'll have to amend that. Not just that one. Where's the other one? There's another one here I highlighted. I don't think it's there. I think it's below now, I highlighted these cases because these cases talk about the estate and how the name in all caps represents the estate and how it's used. The ruling emphasizes the importance of clarity and precision in legal documents, associating the all caps name of the decedent to differentiate it from the individual who has passed away. Pay attention. Each one of these cases talk about how the all caps name is designed to differentiate it from a decedent estate. Now, this is the part where I highlight the thing about racism, personal colors, and all that, and how the courts have a history, a history of unconstitutionally supporting racism, supporting and justifying the unsanctioned and unconstitutional intentional murders of countless individuals through these racist juries. You know, the juries that found people like Emmett Till guilty? when there was no evidence that Emmett Till had done anything but whistle at some person of non-color? The court did that. They sanctioned that. The court in Dred Scott said that the individual was not a person. He was only one-fifth of a man. Ladies and gentlemen, that is their history. You cannot get away from history. History is always present. Don't get me wrong. The courts constantly remind a person who has been convicted of a crime of their past crime. Pay attention. So we remind the court of its past crimes. Okay. We also put the link here for Google where they declared sovereign citizens as being, you know, sovereign citizens, terrorists. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen. Finally, you can take anything out of here that you don't want in here. That's the way it's designed. Look, this shows about a plea, okay? The very act of pleading admits the genius of the record. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why we put all the cases in here. By pleading to the indictment, the defendant admits the facts alleged. Pay attention. By pleading to the indictment.
guilty, not guilty for a plea of nano contender, no contest. Any type of plea is a plea to the indictment. The defendant admits the fact alleged. I'm guilty is what a plea does. People, any of you who have ever had a judge enter a plea against you, go after that judge, go after that court, go after their bond. There is no law requiring them to enter a plea on your behalf. None. Put a stop to this, people. Now, look, he may still contend that the statute under which he is charged is unconstitutional and that the facts alleged do not constitute an offense. Yes, but he's already pled guilty, so it doesn't matter what he contends. That's what it's saying. That's why it says the genius of the record. The record is sufficient. It cannot be challenged. The plea of not guilty puts in issue every material fact alleged in the indictment, including the jurisdiction of the court. Okay? That means they got it because you pled. You said, I am submitted to the court's jurisdiction. I put myself upon the mercy of the court. But it admits the formal sufficiency of the indictment that everything else, all the allegations in it are true. Ta-da! So we're saying, oh, no, you don't get to enter a plea on my behalf. Put me, subject me. That's involuntary servitude. Look at how many cases we put here, people. Okay, so if you got somebody who's in jail, pay attention. Oh, and you just want to sign. You want to be the underwriter. You don't want to put a line. You never want to sign above the line. Sign below the line. Be the underwriter of your document. Just a suggestion. Ladies and gentlemen, what I have to do, and I want you all, I'm saving this now. I can't put it in PDF because there's so many sections you have to fill out, and I wasn't going to make a fillable PDF. Uh, there are going to be so many people who are going to take this document and amend it and make it theirs and all that, and I'm okay with that, ladies and gentlemen. What I'm not okay with is people making money off of my stuff. You didn't create it. I did. Okay, you don't have my permission, but again, I'm using case text and case law in the document, and so long as I use case <coughs> stu uh, stupid law and, and statutes, then I don't have a say-so, ladies and gentlemen. I truly don't have a say-so. As long as I use case, text, and or law, and they call that junk law, but it ain't law. Come on, that's what I'm looking for, y'all. Give me a second. I want to overwrite, and yeah, we're just going to overwrite it. Okay, now what I got to do, because I overwrote it, because I got to go to this right here. See that right there, y'all? I got to get rid of this because I downloaded it. Got to get rid of that. Cha-ching. Bye-bye. Because that was the original. Now I got to see. I want you all to pay attention. Oh, I messed up. Okay. See that right there? That's that link. Copy. And I want to see if it's going to download. See, that's what I'm looking for. See that right there? Talent. See, it just, just put in the link and it just downloads. So the link will be in the description, y'all. Just wanted you all to see that it's already been done. This is for you guys, especially those of you who have someone incarcerated. Don't call me asking questions. I'm, uh, if you want to consult, I'm still doing those. I just, like I said, people uh, said they still needed it and uh, literally said that that it would be a disservice if I stopped. And I've been able to, over the last week, put things in perspective and slow things down. Now I got to go focus on my, oh, by the way, those of you, who are part of the securing one's property, this document was done for you in mind. With you in mind, with your situations in mind. So what you're going to be receiving is a copy of this video. Saying it at the very end so that you know. You're going to be receiving a copy of this video because many of you have been running into problems. The documents we created for you, including the uh, MCFO, or MCO, excuse me, not MCSO, MCSO is military. The MCO, the Manufacturer Certificate of Origin, as well as the duplicate other documents that you need to prove ownership, those documents go hand in hand. I can't explain all the documents here because this is not for the public. This was for, those documents were for you. However, this document has been tailored to fit the situations out there in the public where people are being told that they need a license. 
that they must have a license to travel on the highways of America. This document is created explaining why you do not. And when they do give you a ticket, for you not to argue with them, for you to challenge everything in court, that's what this document is created for. So for those of you who are part of that program, you will receive a copy of the link for this video as of tomorrow. With that being said, you'll also receive the link for the document via email. Have a good day, everybody. Read over the document. See how it applies. We'll talk about it in the future. I got to go because I'm very tired. Been working on this for the last two days and trying to take care of my other personal stuff. Even had to cancel meetings because this was that important. Got to go, got to go, got to go. Y'all take care. Goodbye.